In reproduction and in angiosperms part one, uh, section 9.3 for IB syllabus and curriculum, we're going to look at the different structures and some of the unique um, adaptations that plants have evolved in order to be able to reproduce. And to start with this, we want to look at the structure, uh, uh, the different structures of, of plants that allows it to reproduce. And this is kind of a broad overview of the different parts. Uh, of the flower structure. Um, we're going to look at these more specifically in more detail and focus here, but uh, flowers are often hermaphrodites, which means that they both contain both male and female parts, um, which makes them unique because they could potentially cross uh, fertilize, and we'll talk about how that, that can happen. Um, but uh, they, the flowers have, have both male and female reproductive parts. Um, flowers are obviously, most flowers are very colorful. Uh, a lot of plants produce flowers or fruit, um, different means to attract pollinators and to help spread the, the seeds. Um, and so let's take a closer look at these different parts. Uh, the female parts make up the pistil. And the pistil is composed of a couple different portions, the first being the ovary. And this is where the eggs develop and actually fertilization occurs and the, the seeds mature. Um, so this is the, the first part and that is right in this particular portion right here. Um, the style is this slender column right here, this green one that connects to the ovary. And lastly, the stigma right here on top is the upper surface of the style and its purpose is to receive the pollen. Um, wherever it may be deposited from, its purpose is to receive that pollen. The male parts are called the stamens, uh, and so the male parts are, are slightly different. Obviously, there's not going to be an ov uh, ovary. Um, the filament is a, kind of a thin stalk right here. And you can see that there's multiple of, of these in this picture here. Um, and, and so that's called the filament, and its purpose is to um, hold something we call the anther. And the anther is, is where those pollen grains are housed or kept. Um, and so when, when this plant releases its pollen, however it may do so, this is where the pollen is kept. Um, and the filament is what kind of supports that anther. Inside the anthers are pollen sacs in which the pollen grains actually develop. And so right now it's uh, you know the end of April, beginning of May. Plants are starting to release pollen, and unfortunately for humans, for many humans, uh, myself included during this time, uh, allergies uh, strike, and this is because those pollen grains are out spreading around. Um, some plants have developed uh, adaptations to allow that pollen to be easily carried by the wind, and we'll look at that a little bit closer uh, here in a bit. There's also some structures that are non-reproductive parts of the flower, and one of those would be the petals, and these are often adapted to attract uh, pollinators. Uh, they have d various colors, they're brightly colored. Um, the, the design or structure of them is specifically adapted to help some uh, pollinators land and, and be on the, the petals and to support those pollinators. Other flowers have, have petals adapted so that uh, organisms can't la land on them. And so they're, they, they are very much adapted to a specific pollinator. Um, we also have sepals, uh, and these are the outermost portions of the green leaf. Um, the, right here in our image, um, they're not petals, uh, they're obviously not um, colorful, um, but they're these kind of first green leaves right here, and these we call the sepals. And so if we look at some images of some different flowers, these are some nice images here, you can see that there's, uh, you can see these different parts um, to these. Here's the petals, obviously, the sepals, um, the filaments, and the anthers. Um, and you can see some of these different parts. And we're going to spend some time in class uh, where you get to essentially dissect a flower to help identify some of these different parts. On this one, you can actually see some of that pollen, the pollen grains right here, this little yellow specks, um, uh, pollen that's being released. Here's another image as well. Um, and you can see between all of these different flowers, there's definitely some differences in terms of, of their color and uh, their structural arrangement to some degree. Um, and so they're each a little bit different. Now, pollination is the transfer of pollen from a mature anther to a receptive stigma. Um, it is possible that pollen may come from anthers of the same flower. And this is called self-pollination. Um, Gregory Mendel, when he was working with pea pod plants and kind of starting to discover um, heredity and, and, and genetics, introduced genetics, uh, he did a lot of uh, self-pollination between the different plants in order to complete his test crops. 
Um, and, and so literally that is just taking the pollen from one portion of the plant and transferring it to another. It'd be taking the pollen from one flower and transferring it to another flower on the same plant. Um, if pollen is coming from, uh, from flowers on a different plant of the same species, we call that cross-pollination. And so that is usually helped facilitated um, oftentimes by birds or insects, uh, hummingbirds or bees in this example. Uh, if they go and visit one flower um, to try to collect some nectar, uh, essentially it's kind of enticing the, the flower produces this nectar to entice them to come to the flower and then they, they go and fly to another flower they're going to take that pollen that they get either on their their face or their beak and transfer that to the next flower when they also try to collect nectar um, this can also be carried out by wind um, you know, often sometimes see um, pollen uh, you can see being blown around and, and so some plants have adapted to um, to have the pollen spread by by wind. The process of fertilization is the fusion of a male and female gametes to form a zygote. And so that's nothing new. We've talked about this in the past, um, but the process of how this happens is a little bit different. A pollen grain, right here, pollen grain, produces a pollen tube. This is the growing pollen tube that eventually grows um, specifically between the style um, and into the ovum. So here's our style and it, it grows down here into the ovum. And the pollen actually delivers two uh, male nuclei. One is going to fuse with the egg right here and that forms a diploid zygote and the other fuses with uh, a nucleus um, right here, polar nuclei, uh, which is actually going to trigger the formation of a food storage for the embryo. So there's two, two um, uh, sperm um, that are going to fuse with different uh, uh, female nuclei in order to form actually the seed and then to form a food reserve because a portion of that seed, uh, it's crucial that that growing seed has some, some nutrients as it starts to germinate. Um, it needs energy essentially uh, of a food reserve in order to be able to start growing. If we look at some of the different ways of seed dispersal, um, and seed dispersal is the carrying of the seed away from, from the vicinity of the parent. And this is obviously very helpful and important for plants um, in order to expand and, and to, to move to different areas, uh, the being able to spread seeds. Um, and plant seeds have evolved in a variety of different ways of being dispersed. Uh, primarily wind, water, and actually animals as well are some ways that they, they've done that. Um, seeds in general are oftentimes very compact um, and, and usually relatively lightweight. Uh, and so they can be easily moved around either by wind or water. Um, and, and a lot of different species have adapted so that the seeds that they produced are, um, are very attractive uh, as a food source. And so if an organism comes along and eats that seed uh, and then transfers and moves around, that organism moves and then um, excretes that seed somewhere else, has the potential for that plant to, to be moved to a new location. So wind in this example, um, spreading of seed water, Animals transferring seeds um, by eating berries. Uh, that's a nice picture here. And then one of my uh, one of the ones I think is funniest is a dog running through the brush and getting stickers uh, all over themselves. Uh, maybe you've done this out hiking or something. You get uh, stickers all over you. Those are seed adaptations to help to be able to spread. Now the last topic that we're going to look at is the long and short day flowering process and what what actually causes uh, the plants to flower. Um, the length of the day produces uh, or helps uh, the plant to produce signals that cause for flowering. And this is caused primarily in something called the phytochrome protein. Um, the, a little background on the phytochrome protein. Um, it has a photoreceptor for blue-green pigment. Um, and so it's the, the, the protein um, acts differently based on the wavelength absorbed um, and it can change form based on the wavelength that's that's absorbed um, and so based off of the light that's being absorbed um, plants um, can change the response of flowering based on the length of the day and so this phytochrome protein um, the way that it changes um, is based off of what light it absorbs and so if there's a different amount of lights um, in terms of the day length it's going to behave and act in a different way um, it, uh, uh, the phytochrome protein absorbs a particular wavelength, um, specifically either red light, about the 660 nanometers, and we call that the PR, 
or it absorbs the far red light, uh, 730 nanometers uh, wavelength, and we call that the PFR. And so, got a nice diagram here. Um, this is from Click for Biology, and it helps to kind of outline what what we see happening here. So here we've got our uh, lights, and um, it is absorbed by this plant leaf and the phytochrome um, proteins. And so, based off the absorption of this, uh, some different things can happen. Um, when when this PR uh, is exposed to light, um, it's, it's changed to this PFR. And the PFR actually controls the onset of flowering. And this flowering process can happen in one of two different categories, either short day flowering plants or long day uh, flowering plants. And we'll take a look at both of those. In short day flowering plants, these are plants that flower only if the period of darkness is longer than, this, uh, than a specific certain critical length in order for them to flower. So basically what happens is if darkness is interrupted by um, <clears throat> a brief period of light, uh, the plant's not going to flower. And this will be reversed by a flash of, of far red light. Um, the PFR portion of that pigment is going to inhibit flowering in short day plants. Um, because and if long nights, uh, essentially long nights are necessary um, by short day, day plants um, because it allows the concentration of this PFR to fall to a low level removing the inhibition. Um, and so for short day plants in order to flower the, a long night is critical because it results in a low concentration of this PFR. Uh, long day flowering plants are, are kind of the opposite, and this is causes the um, long day causes the accumulation of lots of this PFR because the pigment is absorbing uh, lots of light, um, and so the PFR, uh, the PR, excuse me, is converted to PFR, and so in the long day flowering plants, um, a short night is critical, which causes a high concentration of, of PFR, and these are linked to two specific genes uh, have been found to link to two specific genes. Um, we'll kind of outline this a little bit more in class, but it's an introduction to what actually causes long, uh, different flowering arrangements, um, or what causes the flower uh, to actually bloom uh, based on the amount of light. In the next video, we'll take a look a little bit more in depth at uh, the rest of uh, the standards for reproduction.